Office of the DeKalb County District Attorney's eighth annual Domestic Violence Symposium and Resource Fair, Building Bridges, Making Connections, A Call to Action. I am Sherry Boston, and it is my honor and pleasure to serve you every day as your DeKalb County District Attorney. And I'm proud to serve as your host and your moderator today. And for those of you that are joining us at home, whether you're on DCTV or whether you're watching us on Twitter or live on Facebook, we want to welcome you here today. First, a couple quick housekeeping matters. First, we could not have this wonderful symposium today without our sponsors. Um, and for those of you that are here in the room and got to enjoy a lovely breakfast, I really want to take an opportunity to thank Ashley Derrick from Keller Knapp Realty, who always um, jumps in to sponsor all the events that we have here in DeKalb. We appreciate her commitment to the issue of domestic violence. And also this year, uh, we'd like to thank APRA Safety uh, for being one of our sponsors. And Ben Harbin is here today. Thank you, Ben. Stand up, let's recognize you. Everyone give. <laughs> we could not do what we do without our sponsors, um, our partnerships in the private sector that understand how important it is to shine a light on the issues surrounding domestic violence and public safety, so thank you. Um, thank you to all the organizations participating in our program and all of the public officials that took uh, time to support us today. Uh, this morning, we did have Judge J.P. Boulay stop by before he headed off to court to do uh, the court's work. We also have uh, Judge Anderson, our chief magistrate, come in. Judge, if you're here, please uh, stand up and be recognized. She will be uh, here later as well. Um, we have Commissioner Steve Bradshaw, who stopped in. He is here. Please stand up, Commissioner. Thank you so much. I'm really blessed to have uh, the support of DeKalb County government and, in particular, our Board of Commissioners, who makes an effort to stop in, get aware, and support these great events for the community. Thank you, Commissioner Bradshaw, for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be here this morning. Also, I want to recognize um, Angela Butts this morning. Angela, if you could stand up and be recognized. Um, thank you so much. This beautiful uh, balloon display that's now moved behind me um, is, is donated by Angela um, for, uh, in, in memory. So thank you so much. Uh, for coming out and also for your continued support. This is your second year, I believe, um, donating uh, this beautiful balloon display that we can showcase again with our purple ribbons that we're all wearing today in honor of National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. A special thank you to DCTV uh, for providing live coverage of this event. Please follow DCTV on social media, Facebook at DCTV Channel 23, DC TV Channel 3 on Twitter, and also you can find them on YouTube and the DeKalb County Government Station. As I said, we are live tweeting and posting, which means those of you in the room, it's okay to take your phones out. I don't mind. As long as you're sharing the message, tagging us, tweeting about us, and putting the message out there that no more, we want no more domestic violence. I'd ask that you um, tag me on social media so we can push your messages out there as well. On Facebook, you can find me at Sherry Boston, DeKalb County District Attorney, on Twitter at Sherry Boston DA, and on Instagram at Sherry Boston DA. Take selfies, take pictures, tweet. If you hear a line, uh, or a saying, a message, a thought um, that any of our speakers today say, um, please uh, tweet that out. Those are inspirational words that we want to trend today. I want DeKalb County and domestic violence and no more and Boston building bridges trending today on social media. So as I said, our custom hashtag is going to be hashtag Boston building bridges. You can also hashtag no more. And be sure to include, for those of you that were here earlier, some of the words you chose in your individual no more signs, as well as tweeting out or Instagramming those pictures that we took of no more and the words you chose that you wanted to say you wanted no more of. 
It is a no more is a national effort to increase awareness and develop proactive strategies to end domestic violence and sexual assault. And that's why we're here today. Each of us has a role to play in building awareness and working proactively to end domestic violence. And more than anything, this year, we said we want a call to action because it requires not just awareness and not just a desire, but a call to do something to stop domestic violence. And each one of you may have a call to action that's different than the person sitting next to you. But I can assure you that each and every one of you has something that they can do to contribute to this great conversation. As district attorney, I oversee the prosecution of thousands of felony crimes each year, which sadly includes domestic violence offenses, some of which unfortunately are fatal. And the reason that we're doing this symposium today is that we know by coming together as a community, we can help save lives. There is no more fitting time than now, in October, National Domestic Violence Awareness Month to discuss and develop strategies for prevention. Domestic violence is real. The statistics are sobering. In the US, an average of 20 people are physically abused by intimate partners every minute. This equates to more than 10 million, 10 million abuse victims annually. One in three women and one in four men have been physically abused by an intimate partner. On a typical day, domestic violence hotlines nationwide receive over 20,000 calls. The presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of homicide by 500%. In Georgia, there were 121 domestic violence related deaths in 2016. In DeKalb County, there were six related deaths. Even one is too many. 70% of those deaths were at the hands of a firearm. By coming together as a community, we know that we can prevent future cases of domestic violence and we can help survivors get the assistance that they need. If you or someone you know is suffering in an abusive relationship, I encourage you to seek help. You can start with me and my team, and let me just say, if you're on the team of the DeKalb County District Attorney's Office, I'm asking you to stand and wave. Stand and wave, stand and raise your hands, please. If you're not sure what to do or who to turn to, those are just some of the people that are here. But everyone around this room at all of these resource tables, and we'll have an opportunity later to recognize you, are folks that can help. We have advocates here that are trained to help you and get the resources you need. So if you happen to be watching this right now, at home on DCTV, at your desk, if you're listening in your car, wherever you are, if right now you need help and you don't know where to turn, we will be here in the Maloof Auditorium until about one o'clock today. Believe it or not, we have had victims that got on public transportation and walked into this auditorium because they said there's help there right now. So I want everybody to know that's listening or watching this, right now, if you need help, we're here for you. No judgment, no shame, no blame. We're here to help and believe. If you're watching this later on, you can still reach out for help. We're here every day. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year to offer whatever assistance you may need. And if you want to call the domestic violence statewide hotline, that's 1-800-33-HAVEN. 1-800-33-HAVEN. That's 1-800-334-2836. Pick up your phone. There's someone on the other line. 
Of course, if you are in immediate danger right now, call 911. Our first responders are trained and here to help you. But we understand the challenges that victims face and that leaving an abuser is often the most dangerous time in a victim's life. And we want to be here for those victims when they're ready to take the next step towards becoming a survivor, to help them get their resources they need, to do it in a safe way, and to leave with a safety plan in place. As we spread awareness this month, we hope that all of you will join us in sharing news about this symposium and our efforts to fight domestic violence on your social media pages, by continuing to post to Facebook or Instagram and help spread awareness, not just today, but every day. But today we're gonna to take a deeper look into domestic violence and all of its related components with several panels comprised of experts from all facets of the DV awareness arena. We hope to dispel some of those myths that we hear out there, shed some light on some real statistics, and at the end of the day, save some lives. So let me start off with our first panel. Our first panel today uh, is a panel discussion that focuses upon marginalized victims and survivors. Teens, seniors, LBGTQ, and immigrant communities. According to national statistics, approximately 20% of female high school students and 10% of male students have experienced physical or sexual dating violence. Only 33% of teen dating violence abuse victims ever tell anyone. 76% of physical abuse towards older adults is perpetrated by a family member. Yet only one out of 24 cases of elder abuse is ever reported. 20% of the L LGTBQ victims have experienced intimate partner violence. And finally, immigrant women who are victimized are less likely to report because of various cultural beliefs. These are all particularly vulnerable groups of individuals who are sometimes hidden in the shadows. How do we identify them? How can we help them? Let's turn to our esteemed uh, panelists for answers to these very questions. Please help me in joining and welcoming the following experts. We have Dr. Elizabeth Ford, the District Health Director and Chief Executive Officer of the DeKalb County Board of Health. We have Aparna Bhattacharari, Executive Director of Raksha. We have Laura Barton, a volunteer at Partnership Against Domestic Violence. And we have the Reverend Victoria Ferguson Young. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's give our esteemed panelists a round of applause. And we're gonna dig in today on survivors on the margin. So let me start with uh, Dr. Ford. Um, please define or tell us what teen um, and young adult dating violence is. Good morning. So, so this is a combination of things. Uh, a child who is violent is generally imitating something that they saw, first of all. So hurt children are children that have seen other people hurt. Um, so we're seeing violence, we're seeing depression, uh, we're seeing substance abuse. The data that, that I have for DeKalb County comes from our own children. This is a youth risk behavior survey that we perform in the high schools every two years. So the data that I'm giving you is our children. And 50% of our children are already taking alcohol by the ninth grade. By the time they're seniors, 71% have tried alcohol. So when you put that on top of you know, living in an environment that's violent, you're just setting yourself up for um, a situation where a child, a, an adolescent or child could hurt another child. Um, the bullying issue is a big thing. And teen violence is just another uh, extreme form of bullying. And so what you're seeing is um, our children are being forced to um, have sex. Uh, in DeKalb County, we have 
12% of our kids admit it. And these are anonymous surveys, so I always take them with a grain of salt because it depends on how comfortable the children are in disclosing. So 12% of our children have admitted to having been forced to have sexual intercourse among high school students. That is greater than the national average, which is only 7%. So for us, it's 12%. Um, physical dating violence is another issue. So just um, being slapped, hit with something, pushed up against a locker, bullied. Um, our kids have admitted, 11% of our kids admitted to that. The national average is 8%. So DeKalb is way out of the, the margins for everything related to violence. And a lot of that has to do with mental health issues. So I, I want you to, I'd like you to repeat that, Dr. Ford, because I want to make sure everyone here in particular at home heard that. So what I hear you saying is DeKalb, right here in our community, our teens are experiencing both physical and sexual dating violence at higher levels than the national average. Significantly higher. So for all of those guardians and parents out there that don't think this is an issue in their homes, what do you have to say about that? I have to say you need to keep an open line of communication with your children, number one, and also be mindful of what they're watching on television. Make sure you're having dialogue with them because a lot of these things they're seeing they're imitating. Um, if you are a victim of domestic violence or if you have issues within your home, you need to make sure your children understand that that is not the norm. So it's really just a communication issue with parents and a mental health issue because our kids are really troubled. A third of our kids um, have admitted to having felt sad or hopeless at some point during the year. 16% uh, have a suicide plan and 10% admitted to having attempted suicide. Uh, that's serious, that's beyond these numbers and they continue to grow every year. So what information or what advice can we give to parents that are here and watching on what types of warning signs they can look for? Because we know teens aren't known for sharing no. with their family. Um, so how, what can we look for as parents for what should be alarming signs? Keep them off of this. Number one, I, I, the, the amount of actual face-to-face -face conversation that we're having with our children at this point is so limited because everything is on here. Even, even our own communication is texting. You know, what do you want for dinner? What time are you going to be home? We are not having dialogue with our children, and you have to look in people's faces. I'm a pediatrician, so I have to look in a parent's face and in a child's face to know what's really going on. And you can't, what, what they text and what's really going on in their life is completely different. They may be wearing hoodies so you don't see the bruises or the fingerprint marks you know they may be making excuses for things so we really all of us and and even within the school system because less than 60 percent of our high schools have mental health services available so even if someone were in trouble where do they go who do they trust so it's got to be the parents we have to be mindful and watching out for our children and neighbors, stop being, you know, be in people's business. If you see something, say something. You know, a lot of times we see in the mall, you know, the guy's grabbing the girl roughly and, you know, you just kind of look away. That's a problem. And so you need to speak up as the adult and say, you do know that that is not appropriate behavior, right? Thank you so much for, for giving us that, that great information on the teens, not just nationally, but right here at home in DeKalb County our teens, our family, our community. Um, Aparna, tell us a little bit about your organization and um, the population, the marginalized population that you work with every day. Um, Raksha. I'll have to push it on. Okay. So Raksha, which means protection, has been around 23 years, and we've been serving the entire state of Georgia for the South Asian population, which consists of individuals from Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Pakistan, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Now, while our focus is the South Asian community as an organization that works with immigrants and refugees, we want to make sure that when we're doing training and everything else that we are ensuring that all immigrant and refugees have access to services. Part of what we provide is counseling, support services. We've been a, a part of creating amazing organizations like International Women's House, which um, provides shelter for immigrant and refugee women. Um, we've been a part of starting Tapestry, which does a lot of the work around advocacy for immigrants, but also um, addressing human trafficking with foreign born and some um, local folks. So we've been around and we want to talk a little bit about like the barriers that immigrants face, right? And, and part of it, it's not just culture, but it's the rhetoric, 
right? What we're hearing in communities that make it feel unsafe for survivors who may speak another language, who might, um, might legally be here but still afraid because once you call the police, that can impact your immigration status. So there's a lot of different consequences for immigrants and refugees when they're seeking help because it can impact their ability to stay in this country. The consequences may not be the same. What if you're not able to work? We have survivors who might be undocumented um, who are more fearful. And so there's a lot of teens who are fearful to talking about these issues because once they do it, that might mean that their parents might right. be deported, right? Or they may be deported. So there's a whole set of the community that just is scared to come out because the consequences are so different. Okay, I mean, we know of teens with one of our partner agencies where the mom got deported and that, you know, and all she was doing was going out and driving <laughs> to pick up something for her daughter. And now her mom is out of the country. So thinking about the consequences being so different for some communities, and then language access is a huge part of it. If you don't understand it, so instead of no more, you would say no mas in Spanish, and then we've got so many other languages besides Spanish that many people would say, um, would use, but how do we say no more? And how do you say no more when that saying no more and taking that step to leave an abusive situation means you're being isolated from your community? It means you may not be able to support yourself because the person that you're calling the police on might be the one who is earning all the money. And, and when a lot of our communities, so like the South Asian community, you have individuals who, don't ha who are legally here but don't have permission to work. So how do they support their kids? So with like student visas or fo folks on worker visas, you're on a dependent visa and that means you don't have permission to work. So that's fine, you can go to shelter. You can be there maybe for a month to three months, but what do you do after that? And so that's where immigration attorneys, I'm, I'm, I see Monica from GAIN, Georgia Salmon Immigration Network. I know Cherokee Family Violence also helps with immigration. That's an important thing of like, how do you get that help? And then even once you do access that help, it can take a year or more for you to get that immigration status. So I, I, I want to parrot back something you just said, because I think it's so important for, for everyone to hear again. So although there may be people here that are here legally, not everyone has permission. And when you say permission, you mean they are not legally allowed to work under the visa or the status that they have gained entry to the United States with. Correct. Um, that that's tremendous because that is a barrier for yes. that part of the community, right? That's a huge barrier. And so also I'd like to know, have you seen a decrease in disclosures or cases being reported uh, by the immigrant popu refugee population given our current political climate? Many of our organizations have seen a decrease. Um, and I think Monica will even say the same thing, of, of people are more fearful. Even though there's relief available, once you get into that system, you're, there, there's a lot of fear that people will be, that'll be used against them. So even though people might be eligible for relief that is under, on our federal books, they're still scared that once you're in that system, it'll be used against you and you won't get help. So I know that there's many partner agencies who have seen a decrease in calls because the community is scared. They don't feel comfortable. We know that in our organization people may call us, but they don't want to utilize law enforcement services because of the fear of the consequences, because then how are they going to support themselves if someone's deported? It's, it's just a whole different set of um, consequences, which is life altering, right? How do you support yourself if you don't have access? You don't have access to benefits. You know, a lot of immigrant populations, they may be legally here, but they still won't have access to those benefits. So it's a huge choice of like, how do you survive and support yourself when you're in that situation? So a lot of things that we can do is like educate, provide services, but also make sure that immigrants can be able to access laws. That's part of where we can change laws to make it easier for them to get the support and be safe and come out of the shadows and not have to live in violence. Thank you. Laura. Um, tell us why the LGBTQ community is a marginalized, marginalized population when we talk about intimate partner violence. 
Yes, I mean, while we've seen great improvements um, in the rights of LGBTQ people here in our country, there are still many places in the world where that is not the case. Um, there's still widespread stigma and persecution of LGBTQ people. Um, in 73 countries, it's still illegal. In eight countries, it's still um, punishable by death. Um, so those are very real consequences that we take for granted being in this country. Um, but even so, we still see higher rates of sexual violence against bisexual people, particularly trans people, and huge barriers to reaching out to law enforcement, um, especially, again, for trans folks because of the very gendered language and system that the criminal justice system is. Um, there may be real fear about reaching out to those systems um, for fear of being, uh, for being charged with mutual abuse and both being arrested um, and the consequences that come from that. Um, we still are not a protected class in the workplace and experience discrimination, homophobia, transphobia in all aspects of our lives. Um, and I don't know if any of you went to Atlanta Pride this weekend, but every year we still see um, protesters um, using their faith as a, as a weapon against us. Um, but like we always say, if they're here at the Trans March, if they're here at the parade, that means we're doing something right by being out and proud. Um, but we are still very marginalized um, in all facets of the community. So we know that already in intimate partner violence and domestic violence, this is a hidden world in, of secrecy mm -hmm. where people are unwilling to share uh, what's happening in their, their homes and their, and their relationships with friends mm -hmm. and family. Um, are they less likely to um, disclose when they are in, uh, when they are a member of the LBGTQ community? Mm -hmm. I believe so. I think there are many of us who've been fortunate to have families and friend support systems who have supported us in our coming out, um, but that's not the case for everyone. So often our chosen family, our friends, um, our, our partner or partners are our entire support system. So coming out to family may not be an option. We may hear things like, I told you so, that's, a, um, that's what you get for being gay or lesbian or trans. Um, you know, a lot of resistance to believing our stories um, because our, our relationships aren't valid in many people's eyes. And um, I know you mentioned earlier the stigma and the stereotypes. Um, I think it's important to talk about today some of those myths. What can we dispel about intimate partner violence in the LGBTQ community? I think we can dispel the minimization of it, um, this idea that it's just a cat fight, a, a fight between two women or two you know, gay men um, just in an argument, that it's somehow less valid or less serious than um, the heterosexual intimate partner violence that we see. And that's simply not the case. We experience the same things um, that all other couples do with the added layer of homophobia, transphobia, and, and pressure from the community um, and isolation within the larger community. Thank you so much. Uh, turning it over to Victoria, um, our, our final um, community that we're speaking of on this panel is our elder and adult population and you've done some tremendous work in this area but what makes the the senior popula population um, particularly vulnerable so there's many, good morning, there's many factors um, that contribute to the senior population um, having even more difficulties coming forward. Oftentimes older adults are challenged by mobility issues, sometimes uh, mental health issues surrounding dementia or Alzheimer's, um, and oftentimes um, they, they can have adult children that can abuse them, take advantage of their finances. Um, and so a lot of times those issues in particular with uh, just physical, physical ability can, can be a can be a huge uh, hindrance with coming forward just the being able to come and and, and call or to uh, actually physically come to a courthouse or to come to get help um, can be even more difficult for those who, um, who who have adult who have caregivers like their adult children um, that may take advantage of them you know there is a strong bond there with his being a child being their child um, not wanting to you know get their child in trouble but wanting their abuse to stop um, 
um, maybe even not knowing that their finances are being taken advantage of. Uh, oftentimes, you know, there are uh, adult children who may take um, Social Security checks without their parent knowing. Um, and so, and they may not even know about maybe medications that they're missing. Um, so there are so many, so many ways that for older adults, it's even more taboo and difficult to come forward um, because there can be sometimes even, even more to lose. Um, even if you're an older adult who has had their finances taken or taken advantage of by an adult child, which is quite frequent, unfortunately, at, at, at 75 years old, it's, it's almost impossible to start a new career and start working again and to rebuild your finances. So the, the detriment and the impact can be even more severe for an older adult who is a victim of violence. So for those uh, folks that may be watching at home or for our elder senior population that may be thinking, um, you know, what is domestic violence as it comes, as, as it's related to a caregiver? Mm -hmm. um, because you hear things in the community like, well, um, they're taking care of me, so it's okay um, that they've taken this money from me, or they're, I've given them permission to pay my bills. Right. Um, and so haven't I already made it okay for them to you know, use my finances? Is that really a, a crime or a problem? How do you respond to that? Well, it well it absolutely can still be a crime. There are there are times in which older adults can um, give permission to their caregivers and family members that are caregivers in particular, where they can have you know some of their funds for to pay bills or even as a stipend for themselves. Um, but what we find is that in over the overwhelming over 90 percent even of elder abuse cases there's financial abuse that's involved um in in all elder abuse cases so it's always you know one of the first things to look for is where is the money like what's happening surrounding money because that's almost always the case it starts with the financial abuse um with taking advantage of older adults finances so absolutely there can be times where people are not doing that so we don't want to say that everyone is doing that um but you can also see you know just signs that can be that there's an adult adult children who um and it, and it can also be you know an intimate partner or or a spouse but um you know people who who don't who aren't working who are able-bodied and you know but there's but they still have a, a quality of life that maybe doesn't seem congruent with you know the fact that they may not be working if we see that an older adult we don't see them anymore maybe their condition has worsened or, you know, there can be signs that show that something's not right here. Maybe they used to come around to, to their faith community more often and now they're not. Um, so there can be times in which it's important to, uh, you know, for, for us as community members to, to ask questions or to, to inquire about, um, you know, that older adult and that person because, you know, that abuse can be even more taboo and in some ways it can be, you know, even a bit easier to, you know, to, 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 to inflict upon someone um, because they have more barriers and more challenges to coming to come forward. So I hope that helps to answer. Yeah. So uh, finally, what are the, mm -hmm. what are some of the resources? Because um, not unlike the challenges that all of our marginalized communities face and frankly, mm -hmm. all of our survivors, um, but it can be particularly more challenging for mm -hmm. a senior or an elder that may be physically in a, unable to care for themselves mm -hmm. um, to leave right, right. <laughs> uh, uh, that type of uh, environment or relationship because mm -hmm. they literally may be unable to leave a bed or to Correct. drive or to even take themselves to the restroom or feed themselves. Correct. Um, Correct. It's almost like they're trapped in a paralyzing situation. That's so if, if that's happening, can, can you talk about the resources that are out there um, so that someone doesn't feel um, like they have nowhere to go if their caregiver slash abu abuser is the only person in their life? Right. Well, one of the main resources would be Adult Protective Services. Um, that uh, organization that when it is under the Georgia Department of Human Services um, is able to work directly with those adults who, who are experiencing abuse um, to get them to safer uh, housing and, and locations. It's not easy to do. You know, unfortunately, there's not an abundance of, of shelters or safe houses that can really work for older adults. Um, and, you know, so so uh, um, Adult Protective Services is, you know, the, is the organization that primarily would work with getting older adults to safe spaces like 
living um, like uh, nursing homes and um, and other living assistance uh, housing that can be you know conducive and supportive and, and appropriate for older adults. Um, so that would be one of my first recommendations is to contact them. Um, there is some resource information that's available here, um, and also Adult Protective Services. I'll give the phone number out because we know we do have people watching. Um, is four zero four six five seven five two five zero um, to get uh, more information and to even to report abuse or to get more help that way. Um, additionally, I will say that um, with the, the, the Ending Abuse in Later Life project that recently concluded, um, many of the agencies in DeKalb, including the District Attorney's Office and the Solicitor General's Office, the Women's Resource Center, the Sheriff's Office, have been trained and have and are much more well-versed in responding and knowing how to help and work with older adults. Um, so even a lot of the agencies that we are familiar with in the community are also able to help older adults like the Women's Resource Center um, to help with housing, to help with working specifically with older adult cases um, and, the, and the many challenges that may come forth um, in working with an older adult. So we, now that we've identified um, and, and spoken a little bit about each of our marginalized communities, um, I, to the entire panel, um, how can we bring these populations out of the margins? Um, what are some suggestions that you can make um, that will shine a light and, and, and let these communities not feel um, like they are being left behind? Everyone wants to go. Nope. Everyone wants to go. <laughs> We're like, who's first? Uh, pay attention. Simple as that. Pay attention. When your kids come home from school and say, how was your day? And they say, good, fine. What does that mean? Um, watch their body language. If you go to fix your daughter's face and she flinches, that's a problem, you know? Or if you, and listen, let me just say, this goes back and forth. This boys to girls and girls to boys. So these girls are slapping around the boys too. So don't think it's just one way. You know, also LGBT community. So the violence goes all over the place. So if you see that flinching in your son, maybe somebody's smacking on him too, because we raise our sons not to put our, you know, not to put our hands on anybody, or their hands on girls. So if the girlfriend hits him, he may not, he's not gonna defend himself. So you have to watch out for that also. It's all an observation thing. Like I said, watch just dominating actions, you know, grabbing and pulling and, you know, or even if your child all of a sudden starts dressing a certain way because that's how he or she likes me to dress, that's a control thing. So you have to be mindful of this. But again, it's dialogue and, and, and get these kids off the telephone and actually have a conversation with them. Everything can't be through the internet. We've got to start watching and observing and communicating with our children before it's too late. We are their care caretakers. We're supposed to be the security system for them. And if we're not there, if we're not aware, if we're unobservant, then this continues. And to a point, a lot of these suicides may not just be suicides. They may be girls or boys who were bullied through this um, sexual violence or domestic violence and just didn't know what else to do. So I think your number of six may be too small for DeKalb County. I bet it's larger than that. Okay, a couple things. Number one, we have to know that with our underserved communities, there's intersections. So you could have a, let's say, Asian LGBTQ elder who we're dealing with. So being able to know that, like even when we're talking about our underserved communities, is that there's intersections of identities and we need to keep that kind of realistic. So when we're doing our outreach, thinking about if we're doing stuff that's focused towards LGBT, are we also addressing the immigration are we addressing the fact that they may not speak English? So that's part of the things like one way to reach is also to be able to see all the multiple identity, identities of the person in front of you. The other thing is show up in the communities. Laura was talking about pride. Having boots, a lot of our organizations had boots at pride to make sure that we could reach the LGBTQ community. Same with the South Asian or other immigrant communities. Make sure you have information translated into the languages and have it double checked because just translating into English is not gonna be enough. Know that there's a hotline. So if you call the 1-800-33-HAVEN hotline, that there is a Spanish um, line specifically to work with Latinos throughout the entire state of Georgia that Cherokee Family Violence Center has sponsored, but they should also be providing language access for other organizations. And they have great posters, so let immigrant folks that you know know that they may have legal rights. 
work with your communities to make sure that they have practices that will work with survivors in their reality. So if they're concerned about deportation, if they have a, a agency that won't sign off on certain visas, what can we do to make our communities more welcoming and easier for survivors to come forward? And any final thoughts, Laura and Victoria, about a call to action? What can we do to bring these communities out and our community a call to action? One very simple call to action to piggyback, piggyback <laughs> off of my fellow panelists um, is to make your materials for when you go to Pride. Um, use those materials as an opportunity to um, engage various communities. So make sure those materials have pictures that reflect the diversity of our communities. Uh, make sure, as you said, that all that various languages are represented, um, and just do do those small steps to make sure that your um, organizations appear accessible and then on the back end re-examine your policies and procedures to make sure that um, someone at the margins if they were to reach out to you for services would they feel welcomed would they see themselves represented in your programs and would they be treated with dignity and respect and finally, I'll just say that it's important in working with older adults to go going to places where older adults are. Um, and so some of the things that we've recently done is get out um, information and placemats through uh, Meals on Wheels services uh, to older adults who aren't who are homebound who can't get out um, even going to you know uh, geriatricians and doctor's offices who service older adults so we can get resource information there so places in which seniors will frequent of course uh, the DeKalb County Senior Centers we've done a lot of outreach uh, there as well so thinking about you know having a as many of us have said just kind of thinking outside the box and, and and going to places and asking the questions that will help to bring um, you know these these survivors forth um, and to you know ask about older adults if there are people who you haven't seen who maybe you're you're curious about to ask about them even in your own family um, to just be curious and to you know to talk with them and see how things are going because although someone may have a mental um, you know just a delay or even a dementia or Alzheimer's doesn't mean that they may not be able to report or know that they're being abused so as one thing that we always say and remember in, in doing this work is to believe survivors and that includes even older adults who may have some uh, mental challenges as well. So to believe them and to also seek uh, them out where they may be. So those are my final words. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to our panelists for this insightful discussion. Can we give them a round of applause, please? And we're going we're gonna to give them a chance to return, our, return to their seats as we bring up our next panel. Um, and I'd ask our next panelists, uh, Judge Anderson, Laura Mora, Judge Anderson, uh, Tony Roberts, and Monica Kant to join us as we come up. And as our panelists are coming up, um, I want to once again welcome you to the eighth annual uh, Building Bridges, Making Connections, A Call to Action. This is our DV Symposium. Um, and I am, once again, Sherry Boston. I am your district attorney. And it is my honor and pleasure to serve you here every day. Um, and as we turn over our panel, uh, I look forward to continuing um, our message around domestic violence. Again, if you're following us on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, we are hashtagging Boston Building Bridges and no more. So um, our next round of speakers, which is Innovations in Civil Justice, um, we have Judge Beryl Anderson, who is the Chief Judge of DeKalb County uh, Magistrate Court. We have uh, Tony Roberts, the Executive Director of DVLF, which is DeKalb Volunteers Lawyers Foundation. And we have Monica Kant from the Georgia Asylum and Immigration Network, also known as GAIN. Um, let's give them a round of applause and thank them for joining us today. <laughs> so we've just discussed ways in which we can identify marginalized populations of the DV victims, but how do we help these domestic violence or these victims of domestic violence across all spectrums? How do we help them in making the decision uh, to leave an abuser, which can be terrifying, navigating the legal process, which can be completely intimidating, uh, where do you begin? Who do you call? What services do they need? 
Um, so we're going to turn to a panel of experts that are going to be able to offer uh, their words of wisdom and assistance on how um, or, and what challenges um, people face in the civil system and how what resources are out there to help them. Um, so first, Judge Anderson. Yes. DeKalb County Magistrate Court uh, has been named a model court for dealing with domestic violence issues. Um, let me just have everybody clap their hands for that. There are only a handful of courts with this type of title. How does a court earn this type of designation? Um, it, it begins with a coordinated community response and um, making sure that you have a relationship with all of your community partners, identifying who those community partners are, um, the relationships that DeKalb County Magistrate Court has uh, in place have been in place for in excess of 20 years. I have been with the court for approximately 20 years. And all of these relationships, uh, most of them, the overwhelming majority of them were in place when I got there. Um, relationships with our prosecutor's office, both, both the DA's office, the solicitor's office, um, community organizations like the Women's Resource Center, um, Raksha, Tapestry. It is important to make sure that everyone is at the table, that our DeKalb um, Police Department is on board, our DV unit, our Sheriff's Office Domestic Violence Unit, that we all sit down and take a real hard look at our role in this criminal justice system. We do not operate in a silo. As a court, we're only as good as um, those, inf those people who are bringing information to the courts. And so you have to look to everyone to do their part. Domestic violence is an awful, it's a horrible issue. It's, it's an epidemic. I'd like to say it's an epidemic. Um, and it's everybody's business. It really is. Um, it's important. That's one thing is the coordinated community response. And number two, it is important Again, it's everybody's business. It's everybody's responsibility. It is important to me as the chief magistrate judge here in DeKalb County that everybody who touches these cases, everybody who works for me, um, whether you are someone who answers the telephones or someone who actually presides over these cases, that you get some specialized training in domestic violence cases. These cases are not like other cases not even close. And so all of my judges and all of my staff, um, I have charged them and it's my responsibility, <clears throat> excuse me, to make sure that they go, get ongoing domestic violence training. The DV cases that we're dealing with today don't look like the DV cases that we were handling when I started with the court, as I said, <clears throat> almost 20 years ago. Um, technology plays a huge part in cases now. Um, cell phones, computers, emails, text messages, and you have to keep up with the technology. Uh, just when you, it's like whack-a-mole, the game of whack-a-mole. Just when you think you almost got it and you understand it, the game changes a little bit. And so it's imperative that everybody involved um, make sure that they receive all the latest information and education on domestic violence cases. Thank you so much. At this time, I'm going to invite to join our panel Laura Mora from the Domestic Violence Advocacy Unit at International Women's House. Hi. Thank you for joining us, Laura. Um, and uh, everyone, please give her a round of applause. <laughs> Laura was in the middle of doing the work. As we started when I said that this is an opportunity for uh, victims or survivors that need help to ask for help. And that's what we had happen. And that's why Laura uh, was not in the room uh, when we called her name. She was doing the work. So we're here to say, we'll drop everything, including our panelists. <laughs> if, they, if a victim yes. needs them, we're here to do that. And we'll step away and do the work. Yes. So thank you, Laura. Um, Judge Anderson, briefly explain the temporary protective order process for us. OK. The temporary protective order process is a civil process. It's not a criminal process. But Georgia law allows someone who is a victim of family violence, or in many instances, a victim of dating violence or stalking, to come before the Superior Court and ask for a temporary protective order. 
These are emergency proceedings, and they are matters that are typically handled by superior court judges. I have about 10 magistrate judges, and myself included, and we handle protective order cases in DeKalb County sitting by designation as superior court judges. And so the judges, uh, very briefly, if you are a victim, you have um, an opportunity to come before the court and ask for assistance. Again, it's civil assistance is not a crime. This case belongs to, you're called a, it, the, it's called a petitioner, the person who's moving the court to take emergency action to stop someone from, from um, harming them, stalking them, um, and you don't have to do this alone. If you're listening, um, it's a complicated process, but in DeKalb County, we have the great fortune, as I said earlier, of having community partners that can walk through this process with you. Uh, we have advocates in our courthouse. Thankfully, our um, clerk of superior court has, mm -hmm. some, has a safe space for you if you are a victim to sit and meet with someone from the Women's Resource mm -hmm. Center. If you are non-English speaking, then you can meet with someone from Tapestry to help walk you through this process. Um, but you have an opportunity to have what's called an ex parte hearing, and I don't want to get too technical, but it's a, an emergency hearing before um, a judge who will uh, review your petition and determine whether or not it meets the legal requirement for a family violence protective order or, fa or stalking order. Um, and they're two, they're, it's a similar standard but two different tracks to get you to that protective order. Um, and I will say that in DeKalb County, we have the unfortunate distinction of hearing in magistrate court about 2,400 protective order cases a year. So if you will divide that by 52, uh, that'll just give you some real hard numbers about how many cases we hear on a weekly basis. It's a lot. It's too many. Um, I'd love to see those numbers go down, not because victims are afraid to come forward, but because the need lo is no longer there. So just know that if you're out there, you're listening, you need some help, um, come to uh, our, the main courthouse, DeKalb County Courthouse, or in Women's Resource Center, Tapestry will be there to assist you. Thank you, Judge Anderson. Um, now, Laura, tell us about the International Women's House and the type of uh, liaison services that you offer. Well, good morning. Thank you for your patience. Um, International Women's House provides shelter, and also we have an outreach office. We are part of the Cal County Family Protection Center. Our office for the outreach clinic is located in Tucker, and the uh, building for the Cal County Fire and Rescue Building. Do you hear me? It's better now? Better. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Well, I'm with the International Women's House for the past 20 years. We have a shelter, but we also provide services for uh, victims who are not ready to leave, or maybe they don't need shelter. We have an outreach office at the Fire and Rescue Building in Tucker. We uh, have a 24-7 crisis line uh, um, number, and um, our basic, or our mission is to serve in, uh, refugee and immigrant women, but we serve everybody. We are sensitive and reference culture, language, and also um, it's not only domestic violence. We serve victims of sexual assault and human trafficking. Uh, I believe like uh, our first panelist was talking about and we're fortunate in Decal County that way our court has been setting for victims of domestic violence to serve uh, service with TPOs and stocking orders is one of the best. We had the opportunity to serve victims in other counties, and the Cal County model is very efficient in our experience. We see then they have the Women Resource Center, people downstairs. We have uh, judges who are trained and knowledgeable about domestic violence. They also have the sensitivity about the language and the diversity we have in our county. Um, uh, at the time where the hearings take place, we had Atlanta volunteer lawyers here ready in case our victim needs legal representation and enable to access their right here. Other counties don't offer that. And that, one of the things we feel very proud about the Cal County. Our sheriff and our um, Cal County departments are very 
uh, invest and they, they know domestic violence, they know how our community is being affecting, and they also understand the diversity community we serve. Mm, and like I say, our program offer from safety planning, um, relocation assistance, safety house, shelter, uh, refer for counseling, um, help the families to start over. And uh, if we are unable to have a space in our um, program, in our shelter, we advocate and, and work with the victim to find a safe place for her to go. All our clients in the shelter in our reach receive the same services uh, we serve males to. And I was talking to one of the uh, um, one of our guests today, he approached the table and he was asking me about it. And I explained to him the experience we have lately with more men come forward and report abuse is being uh, very eye-opening because the dynamic is completely different from, uh, from the female victims, but at the same time, it's the same abuse. It's the same, it's the same, um, uh, the same um, embarrassment, or I can say, the they way I look at the situation is totally similar than in, in, in being a female victim. Thank you so much. Uh, Monica, um, you're with the Georgia Asylum and Immigration Network. Um, tell us about GAIN and what services or assistance does your organization provide? Great, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, I um, have been with GAIN for about 13 years, and GAIN stands for Georgia Asylum and Immigration Network. We are a nonprofit born from the Atlanta legal community. Um, back in 2005, the um, big law firms in Atlanta came together and said, we need to provide pro bono assistance to immigrants. And at that time, asylum seekers, and still now, um, needed um, immigration assistance to fight their case in, in, in immigration court. Um, unlike in a criminal proceeding, in an immigration proceeding where so much is at stake, you are not afforded a public defender. And so the Atlanta legal community decided to come together and be the public defenders. And, um, represent immigrant victims in immigration court. In 20, um, sorry, in 2008, 2009, there was a big cry from the community saying, okay, you're helping asylum seekers, but we also need to help immigrant victims of domestic violence and human trafficking. So we started our second project called the Victims of Violence Project, where we provide pro bono, meaning free, um, legal assistance to immigrant victims of human trafficking, domestic violence, and sexual assault, mm -hmm. along with continuing on the work that we do for asylum cases. Um, we do this by pairing cases up with volunteer attorneys from the firms, and while the volunteer attorneys assist with the representation, we train, mentor, supervise, and make sure that everyone is getting the assistance that they need so that no case you know, falls through the cracks. It's been a really good model because I think what it does is not only does it provide that exact representation that the client needs um, at a critical point in their life, but it also helps with um, the issue. I think the more folks who are engaged in the issue, the more ambassadors you have on the ground talking about what is going on. And that's really important because if more folks know that immigrant communities may react a certain way to these abuses, then the word spreads and it's a good word. And you know, others, you know, in the community, whether they're policy making, whether they're, you know, um, meeting with a neighbor or a friend, it travels and I'm really proud of that model because we have made a change in some of the um, perceptions of immigrant clients who need representation. Um, and what are the eligibility requirements? If there's, if there's folks out there mm -hmm. that, again, are watching this on Facebook or Twitter or on DCTV, yeah. um, and they say, wow, does that apply to me? How, how can I get one of those free lawyers? Absolutely. Um, you know, if we, uh, we take on 
so many cases and you know every year at gain we represent 550 um, clients which is you know a high number but we have a staff of three lawyers four including myself but it's not us for taking on the cases it's actually representing um, all these cases through the Atlanta legal community but if you are an immigrant victim who has been a victim of domestic violence or a crime, you know, here in the United States, uh, domestic violence, rape, um, many other crimes, sexual assault, then there is, th there are visas for you here to go ahead and ask for humanitarian um, relief with immigration. Now, as Aperna said before on the panel, it's been difficult lately um, with the perception, the, um, you know, just with a lot of the words you hear in the media about immigrants. So many immigrants who do face domestic violence have not been coming forward. Our cases have dropped significantly over the last year. And not only have our cases dropped, but also the agency in immigration that are reviewing these applications, they have said that they are receiving fewer applications. When I first heard that, I think I didn't want anyone to believe that, yay, we've solved domestic violence in just one year, because that's not the case. <laughs> What's happening is people are more fearful to work with law enforcement because um, of what they hear in the media, even though law enforcement is willing to work with them. you know, And they have said that they are. It's really difficult to um, combat that perception. And so if you're an immigrant victim of domestic violence, in order to get a, a, a visa, you have to work with law enforcement in their investigation of the crime or in their prosecution of the crime. Whether or not the crime, let, let's say you know, um, you're a victim, you go to the police station, you say what's happened to you, you give um, your testimony, it doesn't matter whether or not the case moves forward. That's not the victim's burden. That, that you know, it may not go forward for many reasons. Maybe, you know, we can't find the perpetrator. But you are eligible for an immigrant visa just by going to the police. But the police also have to um, sign a certification saying that they have been um, helpful in their investigation, even in getting a temporary protective order mm -hmm. and, you know, saying what has happened to you. A judge is also able to sign um, the certification saying that this um, victim has provided information and went through a fact-finding, um, you know, sort of exercise in recounting what happened to them. So um, there are forms of relief out there. And if you do feel like you are a victim, we screen every case and we talk to everyone. So please call us. Thank you, Monica. Um, and, and moving from, from one legal service to the next, <laughs> Um, I want to thank Tony Roberts, the executive director from DeKalb Volunteer Lawyers Foundation, yeah. for jumping in and, mm -hmm. and joining us when, uh, when Laura was doing the work. That's how we all, that's our coordinated <laughs> that's community response, work. people, that our partners agree to step in uh, when another partner is called away. So, uh, Tony, as the executive director of DVLF, tell, tell us a little bit about your organization and what types of services um, DVLF provides. Can everybody? Okay, great. Um, thank you for having us uh, and, and allowing us to jump in. Um, we're always happy to let folks know that we're here. Uh, the DeKalb Volunteer Lawyers Foundation um, was formed about 36 years ago with the sole purpose of providing um, free legal services to low-income families here in DeKalb County. Um, and in particular, as it relates to victims of domestic violence, one of the things that our organization um, does in particular in partnership with the magistrate court and, and working very closely with Judge Anderson and the court system, um, we have lawyers who are in court for every calendar and in the cases where respondents, um, the, the alleged abuser in the case, comes to court with an attorney and the petitioner doesn't have a lawyer, that petitioner can come and meet with one of our lawyers who's in court and see if he or she qualifies for some representation in that case. What we know for sure is that for a victim to show up in court um, almost always completely terrified to see their abuser, um, let alone you know, face their big bad lawyer in addition to that, um, it's a terrifying aspect of things to consider. Mm -hmm. um, folks 
in the best cases, um, lay people just don't know how to navigate that process. In addition to it being scary, it can be very um, intimidating. Folks don't know rules of evidence and things like that that can help um, them get a positive outcome in this case. And there's a lot at risk. And so our organization um, was formed, and this partnership in particular, to help meet that need um, at what is the most critical time in a victim's life. And so we're happy to be able to um, participate in that way in the community. You can call our office at 404-373-0865 if you're a victim and you have a protective order or you're wanting a protective order and you need some assistance with that process, we will be happy to help you. Um, in terms of eligibility, um, there is a... You just knew where I was going. <laughs> yes, for those of us that are watching at home and say again, do I qualify for those free legal services? Yep. Tell us about your eligibility requirements. So um, our office is open from 9 to 5. You can call us, again, at 404-373-0865, and we'll talk to you. It is, uh, there is an eligibility income, so we use the federal poverty guidelines to determine eligibility, and we will talk you through it. We will, you know, help you in working with our partners to f find the resources you need um, to help you get through that process and um, we'd like to be able to assist. One thing we also know is that very often this TPO process is just the beginning of a of, of victim's um, journey to finding a safe space. And so very often what follows is a need for legal assistance with a divorce or with a custody modification or with a landlord tenant issue because he or she may be facing eviction because of the violence in the relationship. Um, so we are happy to offer those services as well. Um, feel free to call us. We do screening between 9 and 12, Monday through Wednesday. Um, the rest of the time we are finding lawyers. We recruit volunteers from the community. Let me say that as well. Um, we have an amazing volunteer base. We recruit lawyers from the community who offer to volunteer their services. And it is very near and dear to my heart assisting survivors in this process because we know what it means to you. We know the impact that it has on your children. We know the generational impact that this will have on you. So if you need some legal assistance, please feel free to call us. We are happy to help. So this year, as uh, we noted, uh, we are building bridges, making connections, a call to action. Uh, and Tony, I heard a call to action out there. For those of you with a bar card. That's right. That are licensed to practice in the state of Georgia. Yeah. Um, you can volunteer for the DeKalb Volunteers Lawyers Foundation. Um, I'm not sure what the requirements are for gain for their lawyers. Anybody with the bar card, right? Yeah, that, anybody. That, mm -hmm. that is valid in the state of Georgia, in good standing <laughs> lawyers out there, right? Because we only want the best of the best lawyers to give their, their time to these, our clients that are in desperate need of services. But if you're out there listening right now, the first call of action I'm hearing right here is, you lawyers, no matter what area of law you practice in, yeah, that's right. criminal, that's right. civil, real estate, workers' compensation, no matter what it is, these folks are here to train you and supervise you on how that you can give uh, your pro bono time to needy uh, clients out here. Folks that really need, this is life or death for them. It is. Um, this is real world, and this is how you can be of service. Any other, as we wrap up, call to action. Judge, Laura, ways that, that you can say, this is something that you and the community can do, not just with a bar card. If you have one, this is how you can help out. But, but other folks, how can they be, do something real and tangible to help us on this side of the work? Mm. I want to mention that it's possible. Um, we hear that for some programs we need eligibility, we need to be screened. All of us can be an advocate for a victim of domestic violence. If we see something or somebody approach us, give her the number. Give it the statewide number. Give it the, our shelter number is 770-413-5557. It's answered 24 seven. 
and um, listen and be uh, uh, aware then the person approaching you and request help the first time if she got a ne negative experience, she's going to close down. And we're talking about uh, women, children, and men who have their life in the line. To make that first approach take a lot. So be wise and open and don't judge. Mm -hmm. Don't ask. Give the information. And, and, and thank you. You can refer anyone and get assistance. All our services are free and confidential. Thank you. Thank judge. You. She literally took the words right out of, out of my mouth. <laughs> Don't judge. Mm -hmm. I am the judge. I have 23 judges that work for me. <laughs> it is not our job to, ju to judge. And, you know, I charge everyone, just support victims where they are. Making the decision to leave is a very difficult decision. Mm -hmm. um, and if you come to DeKalb County Magistrate Court for a protective border on a Monday, and you go through that lengthy process and you're awarded a, a protective order, and you want to come back on a Tuesday to dismiss it. It's that victim's decision. Um, victims know what is safest for them. So don't judge, walk with them during the journey. If they come on a Monday, get the protective order, dismiss on a Tuesday, they're welcome back in our court on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. We will meet you where you are. Mm -hmm. We are not here to judge you. We want to support you. Leaving can be a very dangerous process. We have sa safety planning on site okay. with the Women's mm -hmm. Resource Center, and again, tapestry if need be, but safety planning throughout the entire process is really important. Mm -hmm. Don't judge, mm -hmm. be supportive. Come with them. Maybe you can come with them during the process just to hold their hand to be supportive. Okay? Yes. Thank you so much. Let's give our esteemed panel a round of applause. <laughs> and as they uh, depart our panel, uh, we are going to now move from the civil uh, justice system into the criminal justice system. At our eighth annual domestic violence forum, Building Bridges, Making Connections, a call to action. We want to welcome you back to our eighth annual um, Domestic Violence Symposium, Building Bridges, Making Connections, a Call to Action. Um, and I want to continue to recognize the folks that are coming out today. Um, during our last panel, we did have Commissioner Adams from the Board of Commission stop in to show his support, and I appreciate um, his support in supporting this event. Um, also, at this time, I want to take an opportunity for those of you at home that haven't had an opportunity to um, visit with our resource fair participants, I now at this time want to recognize them so that those of you that are watching us on TV or on social media know um, who is here in the room. Um, we have a hence, a, a, a hen help me out, a hemsa. that's such a hard word to say sometimes, a hemsa house. Um, we have the DeKalb County uh, Clerk of Superior Court. We have Caminar Latino, the Cherokee County Family Violence Center, the DeKalb County Board of Health, the DeKalb County District Attorney's Office, 
the DeKalb County Solicitor General's Office, the Georgia Commission on Family Violence, the Georgia Center for Child Advocacy, International Women's House, the Latin American Association, Men Stopping Violence, Raksha, the DeKalb County Sheriff's Office, and the Women's Resource Center to End Domestic Violence, and the Georgia Office of Victim Services. Uh, if we could give all of those resource fair participants a round of applause. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be here and a part of uh, this very important event. Um, also, there are additional resources that you can seek here in the state of Georgia, and those are listed on the backs of your programs. Um, we are lucky here in DeKalb and in Georgia to have so many great resources, and so all of these community partners are be, are, can be folks that can be helpful. So as we move into our next panel, um, a victim has now had the courage to speak up and speak out and ask for help. Um, they are on the road to survival. Uh, to survival, The abuser has been arrested and is now facing charges. What happens now? Uh, what if the defendant is also a victim? Domestic violence is a very nuanced and complex issue which may require a wide range of legal considerations, particularly on the criminal front. How does one navigate the criminal justice maze? What support and or collaborative efforts exist in this arena? Let's turn to our esteemed panelists for some answers. We have on this panel, Jennifer Stolarski, the Chief Assistant uh, in the District Attorney's Office of the DeKalb County District Attorney. We have Yolanda Mack, uh, Deputy Chief Assistant in the Domestic Violence Sexual Assault Unit, also in the District Attorney's Office. We have Letitia Delan, who is the Chief Assistant Public Defender right here in DeKalb County. And we have Captain Jay Eisner, who is the special victim in the Special Victims Unit of our DeKalb County Police Department. Let's give them a round of applause. So we spent some time talking about the civil justice system and now the criminal justice system, um, uh, who, which are two totally different things. Let's start with um, you, Yolanda. You serve as the Deputy Chief of the Domestic Violence Sexual Assault Unit. Um, how often do you deal with cases involving with someone who's arrested and charged with a violent crime whose defense is that they are a victim or a survivor? Um, the cases come in a lot of times. Um, in those cases, the defendants are, are women. Um, we know that sometimes it can be men, um, but a lot of times there are women who have been charged with a violent crime, um, violent crime up into murder. Um, a lot of times we learn from the police interviews that the defendant is alleging that she has killed her abuser. Um, if we don't learn from the file, then we usually learn from the first bond hearing from the public defender's office um, where they will um, indicate that um, all is not what it seems and that this person um, has been in a long time abusive relationship and has since retaliated against their abuser. So how are, do you go about assessing and investigating these cases where um, you perhaps, you know, have a, a dead body and you have a family of that deceased person um, who's very upset and now we have a defendant that is stating that they have been a victim of long time abuse. Um, and perhaps may have documented um, abuse in the criminal system that you can see um, from history and from uh, the judicial files. Um, it's a very complicated matter to navigate. As you said, a lot of times you have a dead body, so you have a family um, who is upset that that person is um, deceased. Um, but it's important that we start with the police investigation file. A lot of times, if the defendant gives an interview, um, the person will say um, that they've been abused. Um, they will talk about um, the history between um, herself a lot of times and um, the victim. 
a lot of times once we get the file, um, we need to pull prior 911 calls maybe to that residence, um, interview um, neighbors, um, witnesses, um, family members, because a lot of times um, there will be people who will have knowledge um, of some history of abuse. Sometimes it's documented, sometimes it's not. And um, we just kind of go from there. So uh, Letitia, as the chief public defender, um, oftentimes um, you are now charged with representing a person that comes and says to you, um, I was a victim of domestic or intimate partner violence or I'm a survivor um, and, and I have now killed my abuser. How do you go about trying to defend those actions in the course of a, a criminal matter? So, and, and largely the same way that the district attorney's office would investigate, we also do an investigation. Um, we have social workers on staff, so we'll get a social history um, of the client, um, you know, find out what we can in terms of, of their history with this person who is now deceased. We will talk to family members. Um, we will also get police reports, 911 calls, any hospital records um, or doctor's records to show any, any physical injuries that might have been sustained um, by the person who's now charged. Um, we will um, hopefully be able to share that information with the district attorney's office in an effort to try and get this to a point where it's not indicted. Um, or if it is indicted for whatever reason um, it needs to be, that the case is resolved in, in the right way. Um, but it is a lot of um, hand-holding. It's a lot of investigation. Um, oftentimes we have to retain an expert um, to do evaluations of the client and determine if she or he falls under the category of um, a battered person and having the battered person syndrome. And um, what kind of services or support do you, additional supports do you give these particular class of clients? And I'm gonna have you pull your microphone just a little bit closer to you. So as I said, we have social workers on staff. They always have a running list of resources, whether it's um, for um, domestic violence um, um, survivors or drug or, and a lot of times it crosses lines. You've got a person who's got substance abuse issues and maybe that's because she or he has been abused or maybe um, there are mental health issues. So we have a running list of resources, um, whether it's day treatments or housing or um, counseling sessions, whatever is needed, we have a running list of resources that we can give to our clients and their family members. Obviously, um, we want to prevent um, homicides before they happen, mm -hmm. whether it's the, the homicide of a domestic violence victim or a victim or survivor that, that feels the need that they have to protect themselves to the level that someone is deceased. So turning that over to you, Captain Eisner, um, who heads up the Special Victims Unit, um, what types of, of cases or what's the typical types of cases that your units called out to uh, investigate? So domestic violence calls are actually one of the most common calls we respond to and definitely one of the most serious. We, um, so our uniform officers, you know, respond to over 15,000 calls a year. And uh, we put a lot of work into training them to handle them properly, make the right decision. But on certain cases, usually felonies, sometimes others, we have domestic violence uh, detectives who uh, get involved with the case, trying to make sure that we do everything we can to prevent homicide. Um, you mentioned keeping it from getting in that situation, and that was the whole goal when we first started the domestic violence unit many years ago, was to intervene effectively to protect victims before it turns into a situation where they could be murdered or where they would have to use you know, deadly force to protect themselves. And um, what, tell us about the number of intimate partner cases that DeKalb County Police Department receives on a yearly basis, and if you're seeing that trending up or trending down. So it's, it's over 15,000 calls a year. Um, it's trended fairly neutral. Um, we end up, I think, as a county arresting, around, making around 2,000 arrests a year. But we know that's really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the number of instances where someone is harmed in their home. Um, victims are often afraid 
not, if not afraid, they're not completely engaged the idea of having the person who's being violent in their home arrested. Mostly they just want them not to be violent, to stop the behavior, because it's family violence. There's a connection there. Um, so with that in mind, as I hear us talk about situations where victims do have to use deadly force to protect themselves, it's one more reason to use the system to document what you're trying to deal with to help protect you if it did end up in that, in that place. So we know that not all, um, that you do get a lot of 911 calls uh, for help, um, but we also know that there are a lot of circumstances where incidents happen where 911 is not immediately called, but perhaps the next day um, a victim wants to reach out because now they're like, I, I wanna call, I wanna protect myself and my family. How do they go about initiating um, the criminal process if in fact they have not called 911 in the moment? So you can still call 911 to report a crime even if it's not in the moment. It can be the next day, it can be the next week, it can be later. Um, that's something we see a lot and I encourage people to do that because there may have been some reason why you didn't feel safe to do it right then you can still reach out to us for help. Um, you can also, if it's no longer an emergency situation, you could actually reach out to our domestic violence unit directly, 770-724-7710. Um, can you repeat um, that number again for us, for those of us that are listening at home? And I talk really fast, 770-724-7710. That'll reach our special victims unit directly and our domestic violence unit is part of that, uh, that group of people. Um, although still, if you have any question about your safety, 911 is always the best route because the police officer should write a report for you, should give you a case number, if not ask for one. That report, all of those reports come to our domestic violence unit to be read by a sergeant. So your reports will come to us. Um, you also can reach out to the Women's Resource Center, International Women's House. Um, the safe houses can help you navigate the system and we work closely with them so that they can also steer you towards us if it turns out that you know what we offer could be helpful for you. So one last question about how uh, generally the police handle situations. I know that there's a lot of people out there that sometimes call 911 um, because they want someone to intervene in the moment and stop that violence, but they still may be unsure about whether they want a criminal case to happen. Address uh, how uh, uniform officers in your department deal with this situation. So it is a challenge because there's only a few minutes that officers have on the scene to figure out, you know, unravel what happened. And victims, hopefully we make you safe to talk to the officer. If you don't feel safe, communicate that, you know, you can do it in a subtle manner that I need more space from whoever else is here to feel safe to talk to you. So do talk to us and know that the system as a whole has, has heard that you may not always be looking just for arrest and prosecution. Um, that is certainly something we do to hold people accountable for being violent in their homes. But the system as a whole offers a lot of other alternatives also. So, but none of those things can come to play if you don't call us. So, so do call us so that we can respond. Thank you. So, um, Jenny, we know that um, oftentimes when uh, victims call the police and there's an arrest, um, it's very often that uh, the abuser is going to eventually get out of jail sooner rather than later. Um, and we know that firearms are a concern and that our victims are concerned about um, the fact that their abuser may have a weapon or they know of a weapon, whether it's legal or illegal. Um, tell us about the DeKalb County DA's office and the project they're involved in around the firearms protocol. So we started a project with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District back in March of 2018. Um, the Northern District handles federal crimes that happen in several different areas, but it includes DeKalb County, um, which is our county. So this is a project that is designed to focus on domestic violence offenders who are in possession of firearms when they shouldn't be. How many of you know that there are federal crimes and there are state crimes? Yep, okay. So on the federal level, there are laws that say if you are a convicted felon, you can't have a gun, right? And here in Georgia, we have a state law that says the same thing, 
right? Most people know that. Most people are aware that if you get convicted of any felony, you can't have a firearm here in Georgia. And what that means is our local law enforcement can enforce that law on a state level because we have a state law that allows us to do that. So if you are caught breaking that law, that can be prosecuted on a state level here at our courthouse right across the street. How many of you knew or know that there is a federal law that says if you have been convicted of certain misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence, you can no longer possess a firearm? Did you know that? Yeah, there's a federal law that says that. There is not a Georgia law that says that. So even though here in DeKalb County, we work as hard as we can to make our community as safe as possible for victims and their families, unlike some of our sister states that have laws that mirror the federal law, we do not. So there's a gap between the federal law that says you can't possess a firearm, firearm if you have been convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence. We don't have that on the state level. So this project, was birthed out of our concern for that gap in our ability to enforce. Because we know, as you heard earlier, that when there is access to a firearm, um, it increases the risk of a homicide in an intimate partner um, relationship by 500%. We know that. Research shows that. FBI statistics show that. We are concerned about that relationship between firearms and domestic violence relationships. You've been watching the um, PowerPoint scroll this morning, and you probably have seen that DeKalb has the highest number of DV-related fatalities. That is not a contest we want to win. We want to stop that. And so we don't want to stand back and say, oh, well, you know, until we change the state law, there's not much we can do. We want to be on the forefront of figuring out a way in the meantime to be proactive and to be innovative. And if that means working with partners at the federal level, that's what we're going to do. So this project was designed to do that, to figure out a way to attack that and to get firearms out of the hands of abusers. And for those of you at, at home that can't see our PowerPoint, the PowerPoint that Jenny is referencing is we are scrolling through um, county by county in Georgia, name by name. Of, of all the lives that have been taken as a result of domestic violence just this year alone. Um, and so those are the names that, that Jenny is referring to. Um, so uh, how does the DA's office evaluate the cases to recommend them for this particular project? So the way it works is we have an internal working group that is comprised of prosecutors who are specialized in domestic violence and sexual assault. We also have investigators who are specialized in domestic violence and sexual assault. And we work really hard to screen appropriate cases. The entire office is aware that we're working on this project with our U.S. Attorney's Office. And we're looking for cases that come into the office that have two things. One, the underlying charge involves the possession of a firearm. And the second thing is that the history of the person shows that they have been convicted of a prior domestic violence misdemeanor. Those are the only two things. So if those two things have been met, the case comes to our internal working group and we start vetting it to look to see if this is going to work for a case that we would refer to the U.S. Attorney's Office. We meet regularly with the U.S. Attorney's Office to pitch cases, to discuss them, to figure out is this a case that's ready to go, not ready to go, does more work need to be done on this case. And we've been meeting since March. So, so far we have pitched 11 cases, three have been um, accepted, one has been um, indicted and is about to be resolved, and two are um, about ready to be indicted. So we're real happy with the success because, you know, when I talk to other folks in different parts of the state and the country, um, they're impressed that we have this type of collaboration with a federal partner to, to address what is a very critical issue in our community. So once again, um, a, a big push for today uh, is a call to action. Uh, so when we think about the criminal justice side of domestic and intimate partner violence, when we think about um, the firearms protocol and the number of, of cases we have with our victims and how we prevent homicides on either side, what is you all's call to action? 
how can we engage the community to get involved in promoting the issues that you think are most problematic in this, in this field? Well, I'll start by saying, <laughs> as far as it relates, I think there are lots of things that we can all do um, in terms of being mindful and watchful and good caretakers of um, the children in our community and our neighbors and our friends and our family and not turning a blind eye to what is really right in front of us. That's what I'll say about that. But in terms of firearms, um, I would really call us to be invested citizens in our legislative process. Georgia needs to catch up with the rest of the country when it comes to mirroring, mirroring the federal firearm prohibitors. And I hope that someday in the very near future that we have a state law on our books that helps us to be able to enforce what we need to be able to for enforce on a local level. Um, I would just piggyback what Jenny said. I think if you see something, um, you, you should say something. I think a lot of times with the cases, um, it helps so much when you have other people who are not intimately involved, just neighbors, people who heard something, who live next door to them, who lived across the street, who just witnessed different behavior between the two people. I'll talk about resources. First, when you hear the list of the nonprofits in DeKalb, they're state and even national leaders, but they can't do the work without support. So you literally can support them with your donations. The other thing, I'll talk about resources, this isn't self-serving because I'm close to retirement, so I'm leaving. <laughs> But for us to serve victims the way they deserve to be served, we have to have enough officers. And in the current environment, it's hard to find the people to hire. Um, our CEO and our public safety director made that a priority uh, for DeKalb County is attracting and retaining law enforcement officers. And if you agree with that as a voter, you need to communicate that you agree with that to the commissioners, to, to county government, um, because with more officers comes more time on calls and more ability to unpack this complex situation and make the right decision. I think that, um, and, and Judge Anderson said this earlier, don't judge. Um, we, as a criminal justice um, agency, all of us, um, have to understand that there are going to be cases that, you know, somebody calls the police and says, I've been abused, or somebody is um, called on their behalf and, and there's domestic violence going on, but the victim doesn't want to prosecute for whatever reason, um, whether it's financial or whether it's for love or whether it's because of the children or for, uh, because of safety. Um, we have to recognize that that does happen. It's going to continue to happen. Um, and we need to be cognizant of how we're dealing with cases um, on both sides, whether it's the victim who is now the defendant or whether it's, it's the victim who is still the victim. Um, we need to really work on how we deal with those cases and, and sort of push down our, our natural instinct, which is we've got a gazillion cases on each of our desks, mm -hmm. and the last thing I need is, is a victim who isn't going to help me help them. Um, and that goes for us as well as the DA's office and the solicitor's office. Well, thank you. And can we give a warm round of applause for this amazing panel? Um, and as um, we transition to our next panel, um, I'm going to ask our next panel to come forward. We are going to be moving into talking about the legislative process. Uh, and for those of you, again, that are um, joining us from home um, on Facebook, social media, or on DCTV, you are tuning in to the eighth annual uh, Domestic Violence Symposium, Building Bridges, Making Connections, A Call to Action. Um, and uh, we are now transitioning into our legislative panel, and I am welcoming up Senator Elena Parent, Jennifer Thomas, and Helen Robinson. Senator Elena Parent uh, represents uh, District 42 right here in DeKalb County. Uh, Jennifer Thomas is the Executive Director of the Georgia Commission on Family Violence. And Helen Robinson is the Director of Advocacy for the YWCA of Greater Atlanta. Um, can we give them a round of applause, please? 
And so far today, we have been identifying and assisting victims across all spectrums. Uh, we've discussed the importance of collaborative efforts in the civil and criminal justice arenas to support DV victims and survivors. Um, but how does one effectuate change on a more global scale in policy and in law? I am thrilled to welcome our final set of panelists to discuss the legislative process and some of the groundbreaking process that is already happening there. So um, let me start with Senator Elena Parent. Um, Georgians will have an opportunity to vote on a referendum in November related to victims' rights. It is commonly known as Marcy's Law. Can you provide a layperson's overview of that potential legislation? I'm so thrilled by the invitation. Thank you to our DA, Sherry Boston, for inviting me and um, look forward to discussing a few of these legislative proposals related to domestic violence that we've been dealing with at the Capitol over the last several years. Um, luckily, we've got some real experts on the panel, not me, but I can hopefully give you a, a lay view of Marcy's Law. So Marcy's Law is actually a national effort. It grows out of a case um, in California in the early 80s a woman named um, Marcy Nicholas was stalked and killed by an ex-boyfriend. She was very young at the time, I think, um, late teens or early 20s. And not long after her murder, her mother and brother were visiting her grave and um, went to stop by the grocery store at the way home, on the way home, and in the checkout line was the suspect who had been arrested for her murder. They had no idea that he had been um, given, given bail. And it, as you can imagine, really shocked and disturbed them. So her brother, um, I, think, I think his name is Henry. It doesn't really matter what his name is, but he went on to be extremely successful in business. And he's made it sort of his philanthropic life's work to try to pass Marcy's law as a constitutional amendment in all 50 states and give victims meaningful right in each state's constitution to participate in cases that involve their loved ones so that victims' families would be aware, for example, if a suspect has been given bail or is about to get out on parole. And I'm just gonna read you the rights that are gonna be encapsulated um, on your ballot that would be enshrined in our Constitution if this does pass after our election on November 6th. They are the right upon request to reasonable, accurate, and timely notice of any scheduled court proceedings involving the alleged act or changes to the scheduling of the proceedings the right upon request to reasonable, accurate, and timely notice of arrest, release, or escape of the accused, the right not to be excluded from any scheduled court proceedings involving the alleged act, number four, the right upon request to be heard at any scheduled court proceedings involving the release, plea, or sentencing of the accused, and lastly, number five, the right to be informed that you as a victim or a family member of a victim have those rights. So as you can see from the rights that are gonna be on your ballot, um, if they pass, they really all involve um, being given notice and, and meaningful, the ability to meaningfully participate in high level um, sentencing, plea, um, et cetera, proceedings involving the accused. So I know that um, uh, we wanna be clear that this just isn't DeKalb, this is on every ballot Yes. for wherever you live in the state of Georgia, right? That's correct. And I also know that um, usually our referendums are at the very bottom of our ballot. They will be right? the last thing, um, yes, the statewide referenda will be the last thing on your ballot after all of the other races. So a call to action that we can say today is, go out and, right. and vote on this issue, right? That's right, I, absolutely, please do. This is gonna be, um, I believe it's number four. Mm -hmm. On the ballot, am I right? Yes, so it's gonna be the fourth constitutional amendment on there. Um, we're not here to talk about any of the others, but I'll just throw in for you that I'm actually voting for all of them. Sometimes we have really, really controversial ones. Um, you should do your homework about all the, the ballot questions because each of them does amend the Georgia Constitution. Um, but this one's number four. I think this, um, it, it's, it's a result of a lot of work. 
Uh, it did not pass the first year we were considering it in Georgia. It um, There were compromises made between law enforcement and district attorneys, prosecutors, and victims uh, advocates. So this result is a good compromise, and I think it'll be a step forward for victims here in Georgia if it passes. So I know um, uh, that lay people and even sometimes lawyers, when they read these um, referendums on the ballot, it can be confusing whether they're asking that question, whether you should say yes or no, and if you're checking the right box. So um, let's be clear, if you support um, changes to the law, you should vote? Yes. Okay. And if you don't support these changes, then you should vote? No. But so we just want to be clear and understand that everyone will have that opportunity if they exercise their right on November 6th. So finally, um, Senator Parent, um, what other type of DV related legislation do you expect to see or you're hearing may be at the forefront this legislative session starting in January? One um, piece of legislation that actually all of us up here have been working on is a bill to close a loophole that we currently have related to uh, domestic violence and firearms. If one has been convicted of um, d domestic violence, a misdemeanor domestic violence, that's actually a federal bar to um, ret uh, retaining a weapon. But it cannot be enforced locally by our local law enforcement agencies unless we actually go ahead and also put it into state law. So we, uh, Georgia is actually, in my opinion, behind on this issue. We've had other neighboring states, southern states, including South Carolina and Tennessee, Tennessee so other sort of same region as us, also conservative-leaning or led states that have taken actions to strengthen their state laws related to weapons possession and domestic violence uh, convictions. We have not yet done so, and um, it's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, it really is closing a loophole, but we need to give our local law enforcement the tools when people have been, have already demonstrated a um, propensity toward domestic violence uh, so that they are not in possession of things, uh, dangerous weapons that could, that could lead to a deadly situation. That uh, bill has been introduced for the past two years. It did receive a hearing, but no vote was taken. Um, I'm hopeful that we are going to press forward in a strong and purposeful manner, building the grassroots support and outcry in favor of this legislation so that we can achieve that uh, change to our state law within the next year or two. So Jennifer, you are the executive director of the Georgia Commission on Family Violence. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your work with the Georgia Commission and how do you advocate for DV victims and survivors? Sure. The first, thanks for having me and thanks to all of you who are here today. I'm uh, excited to share a little bit about what the commission does and how we advocate for victims. Um, we are a collaborative partner on the annual uh, Georgia Domestic Violence Fatality Review Project. Uh, we collaborate with the Georgia Coalition Against Domestic Violence on that project. And in this project, we're looking at uh, domestic violence related deaths, and we're looking to find out where were the gaps that occurred in those deaths, uh, not to point fingers, but to really address that problem so that we can fill that gap to prevent further uh, deaths in our state. And so one of the things that we do is we, we learn from this report, we learn from lives lost um, to this um, epidemic, and we try to implement and suggest uh, legislative fixes to address those gaps. Um, a few years ago, we were uh, successful at working with the Prosecuting Attorneys Council and other advocates to make the act of strangling another a felony assault in our state. Uh, that's a direct finding from the work that we've done as uh, in the fatality review report. So we really study uh, the, the impact that it's having on uh, Georgia citizens and on victims, and we work to make recommendations and to um, work closely with our elected officials to try to fill those gaps to prevent future deaths deaths in our state. Well, there um, certainly has been some progress on the legislative front, but mm -hmm. what more would you like to see? What are some of the priorities of the commission around 
um, legislating and advocating for domestic violence victims and survivors? Yeah, so w one thing I'd like to see is more folks joining Helen and Senator Parent and I at the Capitol each legislative session. The session runs from typically January to March or April, and um, elected officials will listen to their constituents more than they will listen to me um, standing on the ropes talking to them. So if you um, care about this issue and are passionate about this issue and want to see proactive legislation towards saving victims and ensuring victim safety and offender accountability, I just strongly encourage you to, to you know, find out who your elected officials are, visit them uh, prior to the legislative session, let them know you're an expert on this topic and that you care about this issue, and then show up at the Capitol when there are legislative matters before them that need to be voted on and need to be addressed, and let them know how you as a constituent feel about that issue um, so that they can make a wise decision when they uh, press the uh, button to vote. Thank you. Um, Helen, you're the Director of Advocacy at the YWCA, and you were instrumental in lobbying for House Bill 834 this past session, which helps victims of family violence with housing concerns. Can you tell us more about this legislation and why you worked so hard uh, to get that done? Yes, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share about House Bill 834, which I'm very happy to say passed unanimously in the 2018 state legislative session. And what this bill does is it allows a survivor of domestic violence to terminate a private rental lease without financial penalty early if she needs to move, if she needs to move for safety reasons. And uh, it does require notice be, to be provided to the landlord as well as a copy of a temporary protective order and it went into effect on July the 1st. And so it does apply to leases that have been entered into after July the 1st. It's very important to spread the word about this bill and to make sure that people understand that this is a new opportunity that they can take advantage of, a new tool for survivors to seek safety. So let's break that down a little bit further mm -hmm. because there are certainly probably folks that are watching or listening um, that, that heard that and said, oh, you know, does that potentially apply to me? Mm -hmm. So again, what are, I heard you say, you have to give notice to the landlord mm -hmm. um, and uh, they need to provide a copy of their temporary protective order. That's correct. So the law does require that you have to have sought a temporary protective order. It does, okay. yes. D um, does the law also require um, you, there be a criminal case? No, um, although if there is an order that's been issued through a criminal case, that also can apply. All right, so that's a, a great distinction. Mm -hmm. So you can either have a civil temporary yes. protective order on the civil side, or if there's been a criminal case where there are um, perhaps bond conditions right. or a stay away order in place on the criminal side, that also can be used to break a lease without financial penalty. That's correct. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for your hard work on that. Um, yes, let's see. <laughs> and so what impact do you see this law having on victims and, and survivors? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so before this bill went into place, if a survivor needed to leave and her name was on her lease, um, she would have to break her lease, which re would require her to pay a fee to break the lease and then pay out the remainder of the months of the lease, which would be impossible for many, almost all of us to um, come up with that. Um, or we talk to survivors um, from DeKalb and around the state who would just leave um, because they didn't know what else to do and then their, their credit is damaged right. and they would actually not be able to rent a new apartment to house themselves and their, and their children in safety because they had that damaged credit. And um, it was extremely important that survivors were involved in this. They not only contributed their stories and walked us through as people that were lobbying on the bill exactly how this happens and the effect that it has on, on women's lives, but also they came down to the Capitol to echo what Jennifer said. It is absolutely essential to have the people who are actually impacted by this legislation be involved and I welcome you to come down and see any of us um, starting second Monday of January uh, down at the Capitol to work on what could be the next step in protections at the state level for survivors. So um, one final question around um, House Bill 834. What should a victim or a survivor do 
if they're listening and they're like, okay, I got all this paperwork, I'm going to break my lease, and the people at the business office are like, I don't know anything about that law, or nope, you insisting mm -hmm. you have to pay a penalty if you want to get out of this lease. What should they do or who should they turn to for assistance? The volunteer lawyers that you heard from a little bit earlier are very aware of this bill, um, and I have spoken to many of them in Atlanta and DeKalb um, to, and told them to also tell me if they're having that trouble, um, because part of the implementation of a new bill is to make sure that landlords know about it. We have to have survivors know about it and landlords know about it. and so. Um, I could even I could provide you with a brochure if, if a victim wants to um, get in touch with me as well that you could share with the landlord. But we would love to have this be a process where um, we are receiving that kind of feedback and we can help make sure that this works. So um, what, uh, again, this has been today, our theme has been a call to action and we're asking um, all of our panelists to sort of give what they think their call, the call to action should be so that the folks sitting out uh, in our uh, audience and at home um, can be engaged in this process. And this, more than even some of our others, the legislative side, is really a way for anybody to get involved. So tell us what, um, or give some advice about a good call to action uh, for folks that really want to get involved in this, in this area. Number one is to vote, um, which you've already mentioned. Um, you can early vote or go in person on November 6th and download your sample ballot ahead of time so that you can read through the amendments and, and make sure you know, uh, educate yourself about that ahead of time. Um, and I also just wanna say, get to know your state legislators. So much of the important uh, work that is done around domestic violence happens at the state level. I know federal policy is important too. But get to know your state legislators and um, Senator Parent and uh, Representative Scott Holcomb here in DeKalb were incredibly instrumental in passing HB 834. So I'm a DeKalb resident and I'm very proud of that myself. Um, so get to know who represents you and tell them what you care about. And uh, come down to the Capitol in January and help us when we are pushing bills this next legislative session that can help survivors. Yeah, I'll just um, add a little bit to that. There are, if you've never been to the Capitol, there are plenty of people, including both of these um, wonderful stalwarts, who can explain the entire process to you. If you want to reach out to my office, we can help. And, and, you know, just, first of all, just with the logistics of where do I go? You know, I mean, you can take Marta, you can park, we can help explain all of that to you. If there are certain issues you're the most passionate about, you know, here we're talking about domestic violence, both of these women working strongly in that area, they can bring you sort of in their umbrella, tell you um, how to approach talking to your representatives and others. So you will not be flying blind when you come down, and it really does make a huge difference. Here's um, another thing that I think is really important to mention. We um, take testimony at all of our committee hearings on any, any piece of legislation. It's gonna have to go through the committee process. The way our, our committees work, anyone who is present and wants to speak on a matter can do so. You don't have to be asked. You don't have to be subpoenaed. We don't even do that. There's no subject matter expertise required. We are there to hear from the public. So if you have a personal story in your, your history, your family's history, friend's history, about domestic violence or anything else that impacts um, a law that we are considering, come and share your story. That is your right as a Georgia citizen and it makes a huge difference. And if you hear about a law that you think is a bad idea, say exactly the same thing. You can say, I'm here um, to speak against SB whatever, or I'm here to share um, my support for this proposed legislation and here's why. And believe me, you don't need to feel like you have to be some expert. You don't. And people's stories are taken um, really to heart by, by all of my colleagues. So I encourage you to, give, to consider testi testifying if you have um, a story to share. And please do come down to add your voice um, to the lobbying efforts on behalf of some of these really, really, you know, we don't have lots and lots of high priced lobbyists pushing things for the domestic violence, people that are interested in domestic violence, or a lot of other um, issues that the public really cares about. 
the people who, who have a lot of presence at the Capitol usually are sort of big money interests. So we need the citizens to show up to affect change on things that don't have, that, that aren't making someone a bunch of money. Does that make sense? So you're going to do it. Look at them nodding their heads. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Wonderful. And Jennifer, if you yeah. could close us out. Yeah, I'll, I'll just close out by echoing um, what, what you've already heard. But just with this simple reminder that um, the Gold Dome that's just a few short miles from here is the people's house. Mm-hmm. And um, you don't need an invitation to go there, right? You're always welcome to be there. So I hope to see some of you in January, February, and March um, at the people's house. And um, but, uh, one more thing, Jennifer. Yes. Um, uh, and and I, I am so grateful that both Helen and Senator Parent um, and Jennifer have, have invited everyone to come down anytime you want. But some people may not feel comfortable just going at it alone. Mm-hmm. Is there an opportunity um, that the commission gives uh, sure. for all of us to be together sure. uh, to sure. lobby and uh, advocate for DV issues that you can share with us? There are. I don't have a date for that for next year, but but we do have uh, an annual event, Stop Violence Against Women Day, and uh, you can watch and, and look for that on our website, which is uh, gcfv.ga.gov. Again, gcfv.ga.gov, where we have a day where we invite advocates from across the state uh, who are concerned and passionate about this issue to join us. And um, we we walk through how to uh, lobby. We walk through how a bill becomes law. And, and we, we really want to support folks in this process. So look for that in the early part of 2019. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and let us all please give a round of applause to our last panel. Thank you so much to Senator Parent. Uh, Jennifer Thomas and Helen Robinson for your insight into the legislative process related to domestic violence advocacy and prevention. And while you are exiting stage left, (laughs) thank you so much, um, as we give them a chance to return to their seats, I really want to express uh, my heartfelt gratitude to all of our panelists today. I hope that these discussions have been enlightening for you here and for those of you at home. Um, that we certainly want to educate, motivate, and inspire. We know that a coordinated community response like this can truly make a difference in people's lives, and we hope that this year it has inspired um, all of you to take action. When we hold our annual symposium and visit other groups to speak about domestic violence across our community, victims sometimes approach us for help. And as I mentioned at the outset a few years ago, we did have Um, a victim right here at this symposium who came to us with no place to to go. She had fled an abusive relationship from across the country with her two children and her baby. And she saw that we were doing this symposium on TV. And when she got here, one of our advocates was able to put her in touch with the Women's Resource Center to end domestic violence. And WRC put her in a safe house, helped her get her life together. And today, not only is she doing better, She has become a spokesperson helping others to get out of abusive relationships. Her story now gives others hope, and that is what we want to do here today to help victims take that cautious step to safety. Domestic violence is not a private problem. It's our problem. And none of us should ever look the other way if we suspect someone is being abused. It will take all of us working together as a community to end domestic violence. In order to change lives, we need your help. Uh, We need you as family, as friends, as neighbors who see domestic violence happening. Believe a victim when they make an outcry and don't turn a blind eye to what you're observing. Too many times after a domestic violence fatality, the people in that victim's lives start to connect the dots. Help connect the dots before the ultimate price is paid. If you open your eyes, you'll see them. You'll see the signs. They're there. Help the victim connect with emergency and support services. Seek guidance from professionals in the field, especially if you are considering confronting your abuser. And those professionals are all in this room today because this can be dangerous. This is nothing to toy with, nothing to play with. 
This is someone's life at stake. And we want to make sure that when they leave, that they do so safely. Let the victim know you will always be there, no matter what they decide to do. I think I heard at least four different times today, including from Judge Anderson, she said, don't judge. Many of our panelists said, don't judge. We can't judge. Right now, we're living in a society where too many people are unwilling or unable to believe someone that says that they've been abused. Believe them. Don't question, don't judge. Leaving an abusive relationship is dangerous and complicated. Do not get frustrated if this process takes longer than you think it should take. It's a long journey. It really is. And the journey doesn't end when someone leaves. There's so much more that goes in to coming through on the other side. And there's no timeline on that. It could be days, it could be months, more likely it's years and often it's decades. Assist with gathering evidence that can later be used in court. We all have a cell phone, take those pictures. Be willing to provide a statement to the police, meaning be willing to be a witness if someone needs you to be. Don't say, oh, well, I don't wanna get involved. I mean, I, I can't go to court. I can't give a statement. I don't want to raise my hand and answer questions. Be willing to do that. If you see it, say something, but be willing to say it when that person needs you the most. And be willing to work with prosecutors if that's where we're at. Because we can't do this without your testimony. We are all in this together. So as we end our day now, I want to introduce a very special guest who has experienced domestic violence firsthand. She has triumphed from victim to victory, and she's a survivor, an advocate, and an activist. Tamika Laurie Pugh, often referred to as the empowering diva, is a voice for women's empowerment. And as the CEO of Empower Me Life Coaching and Consulting, a personal development and lifestyle enhancement firm for women, and the founder of the Still Standing Alliance, a nonprofit that focuses on domestic violence awareness, advocacy, and prevention, she has constructed a powerful movement dedicated to the empowerment and personal development of women across the world. In the wake of growing prominent domestic abuse cases, more and more people are demanding tangible solutions to eradicate domestic violence. From the NFL to Main Street, as a speaker and an author and a change expert, Tamiko not only offers insight and eye-opening solutions, she has become a rising dynamo who has influenced crime victims' policies. Tamiko is a member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, the Mecca chapter, where she serves as the first vice president of programs. In this role, she is responsible for supporting the organization's visions to make a significant impact on the lives of women and girls in the area of health, economic development, civic engagement, financial literacy, and education through advocacy. She's also an active member of several other professional women's organizations and women's advocacy groups across the country. Over the years, she has received uh, many awards and recognitions, including the 2013 Atlanta Rise and Community Excellence Award, the Visionary of the Year Award, and the Unsung Heroine Award for her dedication to women's advocacy, as well as the fight to end domestic violence, just to name a few. Tamiko believes that empowerment comes from within and can be achieved by honoring yourself, your values, and expressing your talents and gifts. Please help me welcome the empowering diva, Tamiko Lari Pugh. Good afternoon, everyone. 
So I always laugh when I hear people say the Empowering Diva. That was a nickname um, that a group of friends gave to me a few years ago, so I just kind of uh, kind of took it on. But um, it's a pleasure to be here today to serve as your speaker. Um, special thanks to the DeKalb County District Attorney, Sherry Boston, um, and her team for inviting me here today. I definitely count it a privilege and an honor. Um, ironically, five years ago, um, in 2013, I stood at this exact same podium where I shared my story publicly for the very first time. Um, Ms. Boston was then the DeKalb County Solicitor General. And um, the funny thing is a few weeks before um, I spoke here sharing my story, I had just finished up a public speaking master communicator court, master communication class. Um, and we were on lunch break that day, and I got a phone call from Sonia Brown, who I think then was the assistant um, solicitor general, I think, at that time. But she called and said, hey, we want you to come and speak and share your story. So I was like, wow, this is awesome. I'm graduating from public speaking class today, and I get to go and share my story. But needless to say, um, I got here and stood at this podium, and I thought to myself, what have I gotten myself into? Do I really want to share my story? in front of a bunch of strangers. Um, so the day of the event, I just remember my voice was shaking, my knees were trembling, and my armpits were sweating. And I was like, whatever you do, don't lift up your arm because they're going to see the wet marks under your armpits, right? <laughs> um, so. Long story short, I did the best that I could sharing my story, and um, my hands were clammy and all that stuff, sweaty armpits. I did the best that I could at that moment. So the following year, um, Ms. Boston served as a keynote speaker for my annual Purple Affair, and then the year after that, uh, Sonia Brown actually served as our keynote speaker, and then this past Saturday, we honored um, Sherry Boston with the Excellence in Community Service Award. So let's give her a hand for that, for the work that her office is doing um, as it relates to domestic violence. And so again, here I am five years later, uh, standing at the same podium. Um, since 2013, I've probably shared my story over 100 times, but guess what? My voice still shakes. Right, my hands still get clammy and I still sweat a little bit, but it's okay because my mentor told me that the moment that you are no longer nervous is the moment that you stop caring about the people. And so it's okay um, to be a little bit nervous every now and then because I definitely care about the people. So I heard Oprah Winfrey once say, speaking your truth is the most powerful tool that you have when it comes to advocacy. And so today I'm gonna to share my truth, I'm gonna share my story as that powerful tool of advocacy to make a difference in the lives of men and women who are affected by domestic violence. And so with the recent prominent, prominent domestic violence cases involving celebrities, entertainers, athletes, um, including the NFL, um, I wrote an open letter to domestic violence victims recently and the letter was picked up by Rolling Out Magazine. Um, it was picked up by Sheen and some other um, media outlets. And what I'm gonna do, um, I wanna share a little bit of that letter with you today. And it reads as follows. Dear domestic violence victim, you may not know me, but I know you. Your troubled eyes, deflated spirit, and intense defense of the man you love are all too familiar to me. You see, just not too long ago, I was you. The monologues of defense that streamed from my consciousness became my morphine for the emotional anguish I was experiencing on a consistent basis. Guilt. If I hadn't been looking at my phone while he was talking to me, then maybe he wouldn't have had to cuss me out. Embarrassment. I can't tell anyone that he hits me or that he hurts me. I'm Tamika Laurie Pugh, the Empowering Diva. Stuff like that doesn't hurt happen to people like me. Fear. If I leave, what will I do? What will he do? He has a gun under the pillow. Denial. He only treats me like this because he loves me. Besides, it's not like he leaves physical bruises. 
And in the modern era of social media, these self-deprecating thoughts are only compounded by the numerous unsolicited comments about domestic abuse and its implications. There are people blaming you, the victim, for staying, blaming you for the abuse and demanding your answers to the hashtag why I stayed movement instead of demanding hashtag why does he hit. As a former abuse victim, I apologize for the miseducation of those who don't understand that you can still love your abuser and yes, maybe even defend them. I know firsthand that money, lifestyle, and appearance plays very little part in the decision to stick it through and show the world what love is supposed to look like. Because despite the occasional arguments, fights, shoving matches, and mental kicks, you're convinced that love is what brought you together, and you're convinced that love is what's going to keep you together. I remember on several occasions being choked until I almost passed out thinking to myself, I'm about to die. But the most horrific incident was the day that I left my abuser. We were driving up the interstate, and I told him that I was leaving him for good on that day. He got so angry that he forced the car onto the side of the road, where he began to hit me, punch me, and choke me until I was unconscious. The next thing I remember was being in the middle of Interstate 85, with cars swerving around me, trying to prevent from hitting me. Thankfully, someone saw what happened that day and they called the police. I thought for sure I was gonna die on that day. My life flashed before my eyes. I made it out, but not everyone does. Dear domestic violence victim, I want you to know that you're not alone. Whether it happens again or not, take note that most abusers are repeat offenders unless they get some type of counseling or therapy. Loving him is not enough to fix him. Okay? Loving him is not enough to fix him or the situation. Right now, what you need is self-love. I know this because, like I said earlier, I used to be you. One of the most powerful lessons that I've learned throughout my life is that loving myself is the very key to my happiness and my emotional well-being. It is a fact that many of us are not even aware of. Self-love gives us, gives us clarity. It gives us clarity of mind and motivation to be a better person. It helps us to achieve greater things for ourselves, mind, body, and spirit. Love yourself. It's the real love that the world should see. Yours in survivorship, Tamiko. And so what inspired me to write this open letter to domestic violence victim, um, my main goal behind this is to make sure that domestic violence victims know that they have someone out there rooting for them and supporting them in their efforts to become a survivor. Because so often, as a victim, uh, again, people want to victim blame. And so often, victims are ridiculed for staying with abusers and even blamed for the abuse. I wanted to take a moment to educate the public on what goes on in the mind of a victim, why they feel trapped, and why they stay. As a former abuse victim, now living as a survivor, it is my responsibility and it is my duty to breathe hope into those who are going through what I was able to survive. When a victim sees that there is life after abuse, it gives them the courage and strength to possibly leave. So many victims are, um, they feel like they're being silenced. They're suffering in silence. And so that's the reason why I share my story. Most people assume that domestic violence is only physical, but domestic violence comes in many forms. Some other forms of abuse are emotional, psychological, verbal, financial, and even spiritual. And I shared with you the day that I tried to leave my abuser when he was physically abusive, but that was actually the first time that he was physically abusive with me. Prior to that, um, I always say that I was beaten emotionally, I was beaten spiritually, until I became a broken soul. It's easy to heal a broken leg or a broken arm, but how do you heal a broken spirit? How do you heal a broken heart? And so those are the bruises that a lot of people don't see. And so by the time that person decides to physically hit you, you've already been broken internally, and so you think that you deserve the abuse. 
In a nutshell, domestic violence is a pattern of behavior used by one partner to maintain power and control over another in an intimate relationship. And the key word here is power and control. So if a person can have power and control over you through, your fi through finances, that's a form of abuse. If you can have power and control over me by just looking at me a certain way, that is a form of abuse. Power and control are the key words there. So for those of you who don't know, one out of three female homicide victims are killed by domestic violence. 80% of, of violence homicides have a history prior to abuse. Domestic violence results in 18.5 million mental health care visits each year. Domestic violence is not just an NFL issue, it's not a celebrity issue, it's not a low income issue, it is a community issue. And so what can we do as a community to help eradicate domestic violence? We've heard from a lot of people today and we've heard a lot of call to actions and so I just wanna give you a few things that you can do from the eyes of a survivor, uh, what I think that you all can do to help us eradicate domestic violence. One of the things is education. Simply put, knowledge is power. The more we can inform and educate people about domestic violence, the closer we can get to eliminating it and having symposiums like we are at, like we're having today. Understand the problem. Common statistics illustrate just how much our society on um, both a local and a national level is affected by domestic violence. Understand your role in prevention. Don't just say somebody needs to do something about that. No, you need to do something about it. We need to do something about it. So understand your role in prevention. There are things that you can do on both a personal and a community level to prevent domestic violence in our communities. Educate our youth. If we start with the youth, we have a huge chance of lowering the cases of domestic violence. There are several teen dating violence and healthy relationship curriculums um, that are available, including mine. Okay, that's a little plug. But edu education and support from uh, faith-based communities is very important. Um, faith communities play a significant role in providing support for, vi for victims of domestic violence and in holding abusers accountable. Spiritual leaders are often the first place a person turns to in times of trouble and turmoil, and they should be in a position to provide counsel, support, and safety for domestic violence victims. Bring awareness. Bring awareness by holding community forums, community symposiums, um, edu educational seminars, and rallies. The other thing you can do is advocate. Advocacy is an activity uh, by an individual or group which aims to influence decisions within the political, economic, and social systems and institutions. An effective advocate is one who influences public policy, legislation, and laws by using different strategies and information to encourage our leaders to take action. Talk to your elected officials. Go visit them at the state capitol. We just talked about that with the legislative panel. Write letters to them, call them. They work for you. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to share my testimony and um, Senator Parent talked about sharing testimonies during the hearings and I was able to share my testimony um, and help influence House Bill 911, which made strangulation a felony in the state of Georgia. It used to be a misdemeanor. Uh, this past legislative session, we also talked about Marcy's Law, which is the crime victims' rights bill that's gonna, that we want to be added to the Constitution. Um, and so we were advocating on behalf of crime victims' rights. Uh, the Marcy's Law bill, uh, as, as we discussed earlier, is gonna be on the ballot. It is amendment number four. Um, and I didn't plan to do this, but I do want to read to you um, what is going to be, uh, what's gonna be added to the Constitution. And so for crime victims, it's the right to receive information about their rights, the right to receive notification of proceedings in criminal cases, the right to be present at court proceedings, the right to be heard at plea or sentence, sentencing proceedings, the right to uh, assert additional statutory rights, and the right to be treated with fairness, respect, and dignity. These are already in the Crime Victims Bill of Rights, but we just wanna add those to the Constitution. And then one of the most successful forms of advocacy was the Women's March on, on Washington, which drew 
up to or maybe even over a million people. And according to the organizers, it was meant to send a bold message to our new administration on their first day of office and to the world that women's rights are human rights. And we can do the same thing for domestic violence. Could you imagine being at the United States Capitol on Capitol Hill, marching with a million people, marching for rights for domestic violence victims? That would be so amazing. The other thing you can do is break the silence. And I heard a couple of people say, if you see something, say something. In other words, use your voice. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Use your voice against domestic violence. Again, it is not a private issue. It is a community issue. It's everybody's business. It can affect your home. It affects us at work, your church. It affects our neighborhoods. It's affecting our communities. My ultimate vision is to create a society where violence against women is not tolerated and where individuals, communities, institutions, and policymakers can all come together to increase awareness, eradicate domestic violence, and foster an environment in which all survivors have access to resources needed to survive after abuse. And as I close, I just want you to remember that speaking your truth is the most powerful advocacy tool that you have. So today I share my truth, I share my story as that powerful tool of advocacy. I'll continue to speak my truth. I'm going to continue to share my story, even if my voice shakes, my legs tremble, and my armpits sweat. It took me quite a long time to develop a voice, and now that I have it, I will not be silent. Thank you. Tamiko, thank you for always being here, for always be willing to share uh, your story, um, for always willing to support all that we do. Um, and so with that, we'd like to honor you with a small token of our gratitude and appreciation for your work. So if I could get you to come back up. want to present you with this lovely bouquet of flowers as just a token of appreciation um, for how beautiful you are inside and outside uh, with the voice that you have used to empower so many victims, survivors, and women everywhere. So thank you. <laughs> so, um, Thank you so much for everyone for participating in our symposium today. Whether you're here at home watching this uh, later tonight uh, on Facebook or social media when you didn't have a chance to be here with today, thank you for tuning in and supporting us. Um, I encourage you to contact uh, my office or any of our partners here today um, if and when or you or someone you know needs help. We must all continue working together to help survivors get the help that they need, and we do need to do more to change the attitudes that perpetuate domestic violence. Thank you for being a part of our coordinated community response and this year's call to action. I hope that each one of you, I encourage each one of you to today, before the day is out, I want you to go home before you lay your head on your pillow tonight and decide what your call of action is going to be. Make that your mission and your mantra moving forward and say, this is just the one thing that I'm going to do personally. That could be in any area, but I want you to think about what that is. And I want you to make it a priority that you're going to have that one call to action. Because one call to action can turn into something greater and bigger and more than you know. And when I think about and look at uh, Tamiko, our speaker today, she had a call to action. 
and she turned it into something huge and amazing that has now touched hundreds and thousands of lives. And although she is truly spectacular, you don't have to be spectacular to effectuate change. It just takes one person choosing to do one thing. And you never know what that one thing will do to the person sitting next to you that is inspired to do that one next thing. That's what being about a coordinated community response is. And that's this year's plan, a call to action. Thanks again to our sponsors, Ashley Derrick at Keller Knapp and APRIS, uh, for, for all the panelists and partners, for everyone that shared, to DCTV, and to everyone who joined us today in either person or virtually to raise awareness about national domestic violence. If you haven't already done so, please make us sign our no more sign. Take your own no more sign that we gave you. Hang it in your office, hang it in your house, put it on your refrigerator. So when people come by and see it and ask you, what does that mean? You have now opened yourself up to an opportunity to talk about this issue. Mine was no more shaming or blaming our victims. What was yours? Tweet that out on social media today. Just say what it is, whether it's no more lies or no more tears, no more violence. Put that message out there and give someone an opportunity to ask you, what do you mean? Take some more selfies. Hashtag. Together we can end domestic violence. Every year I always say, I hope I don't have to be back here next year. And I'm, I'm making that same plea and call right now. I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this work anymore because there's no left work to do. People always say to me, but you're the district attorney, Sherry. What are you going to do if you don't have any cases to prosecute? I'll be happy and glad to stay home, y'all and give up this job if it means my community is a much safer place, that families and children are free of domestic and intimate partner violence. As the mother and raising two daughters, I'd be happy not to have to explain to them, what does that mean, mommy? What is a domestic violence symposium? My girls came with me this year um, when I received the Champions for Change Award um, given out by the Women's Resource Center, and I pulled them out of school so that they could come to the luncheon to hear me publicly at that large forum. Some of you have been here before, um, know my family's story about domestic violence. But I had never really talked about that with my children in the room. Um, nor with my mother in the room. Um, and it is my grandmother's story, a story that has been discussed quietly and silently, but always there for her 93 years of life. But I took my girls because I wanted them to see what you can do, but I also wanted them to hear about their great grandmother and what she went through. I share that so I might prevent them from ever experiencing that. I'm hopeful for that. But it's not lost on me that just because my children um, are my children, just because I'm the district attorney of DeKalb County, just because I'm aware and educated about domestic violence, does not mean that that is a cloak of armor to protect my children from what they could be facing in this world. But what I can do is talk to them about education in the community. What I can do is make sure they know that love is respect. What I can do is make sure they know that I will always be there no matter what and that they can seek resources. And that's what we need to do for our community. Young, old, sister, brother, children's mother, father. That's what we've got to do. So thank you so much for being here today. 
Thank you for sharing with us today your time, your attention, and your stories. And let's get out there and take our call to action and make it mean something. Once again, I am Sherry Boston, and it is my honor and my pleasure to serve you every day as your DeKalb County District Attorney. Thank you.